banner, which I hope you received one on the way in. I just want to call your attention to two very quick announcements, and then we'll meet and greet uh, one another. The first one is next Sunday. Uh, we have decided to always dedicate the Sunday after Easter to the issue of human trafficking. It is a massive issue that is a global phenomenon. Uh, there are more slaves at this point in history right now than at any time in history. And so next week, we're going to have a guest speaker, which many of you met last year, Katerina Rosenblatt. She was rescued from human trafficking, and now she runs an organization that frees young ladies here in the South Florida area. She's going to be sharing more of her testimony and also bringing a young lady uh, that we will just call Joy for the moment because we can't say her name. We can't reveal her last name either, who was, from what I understand in her testimony, was being trafficked out of FAU, uh, the university up in Boca Raton. So she's going to be sharing her testimony next Sunday. So I invite you to come back next Sunday. It's going to be a very powerful Sunday. We call it Freedom Sunday. It's here in your bulletins. Second announcement is for those of you with young ones, for those of you who have neighbors with young ones, VBS is coming, Vacation Bible School. Please see JV out in the lobby uh, about that. We're starting sign up today. She has some little handouts for you, and I, I'm not sure if we have a video, but if we do, we'll show it to you after the service. So having said that, let's stand up for a moment. Go ahead and extend a hand to your neighbor. Wish them a happy Easter. Let them know the Lord is risen. Give them a, a handshake and a hug and welcome them in the name of the Lord. is alive the empty cross the empty grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out Jesus is alive he is alive face I am yours Jesus you are mine and destroy perfect peace earthly pain finally will cease celebrate Jesus is alive he's alive and oh, happy day happy day Washed my sin away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you washed my sin away, oh, happy day, 
stuff down at the cross. God, today, just like every day that you bless us with on this earth, we have the opportunity to come to you again and again and lay it all down, Lord. And as we sing the song, Victor's Crown, this is dedicated to declaring that freedom from all our troubles, all of our trials, from anything that weighs us down, Lord, because you lift us up 
to join you, God, because you are alive, because you are on the cross for us, and you are resurrected, and so are we, God. So in the name of Jesus, thank you for being our defender. You are always fighting for us. You are always fighting for us. Heaven's angels all around. My delight is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple. Let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. Hallelujah. You have
Hopefully will come down. Because of the cross, because love ran red, we can say every stronghold shall be broken. Not hopefully. We believe that. Because of the cross. Because his blood ran red. Sing this together. There's a place. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide.
I can hear is that he hears us. This may sound funny, but he's so excited. He's so excited to hear you today. Lord, thank you for every single person in this room. They are here for you, God. And it doesn't matter how they got here this morning. They got here. Lord, renew them. As you live in our hearts, God, just clean it out and resurrect it just like we are celebrating your resurrection today. Lord, you created us to make a joyful noise, and that is what you are getting from us today, God. You created us to declare your power, and that is what you are getting from us today, God. And it is all because of you. And only because of you, Lord, we can ask that you continue to bless our steps as we walk with you and we seek you and we speak about you to others, God. You saved our life. You are our hero. The one we talk about at parties. The one we talk about on the internet. The one we mention in conversation. Thank God for Jesus. (laughs) Thank you for Jesus. Because you don't know what I was like before. God, we thank you for this opportunity to stand in wonder and awe and excitement and love and most importantly, in your presence, glorifying you, loving you, and hearing from you, receiving from you, God. What a joy. Lord, I just I just continue to ask for renewal. We are grateful, God. We are your grateful, imperfect people. And I just continue to ask for blessing in the form of renewal and healing. Day in and day out as we begin a new year with you. By the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Hallelujah and amen. Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative in which every story, every character points beyond itself to one who is greater. The story of Adam and Eve is not just about the first man and woman. There is a true and better Adam who passed the test in the garden and whose obedience is ascribed to us. There is a true and better Abel who, though innocently slain, has blood that cries out not for our condemnation, but for our acquittal. There is a true and better Abraham who answered the call of God to leave all the comfortable and familiar and go out into the void to create a new people of God. There is a true and better Isaac the son of laughter, of grace, who was not just offered up by his father on the mount, but was truly sacrificed for us all. There is a true and better Jacob, who wrestled and took the blow of justice we deserve, so we, like Jacob, only receive the wounds of grace that wake us up and discipline us. There is a true and better Joseph, who at the right hand of the king forgives those who betrayed and sold him and uses his new power to save them. There is a true and better Moses who stands in the gap between the people and the Lord and who mediates a new covenant. There is a true and better rock of Moses who struck with the rod of God's justice now gives us water in the desert. There is a true and better Job, the truly innocent sufferer, who then intercedes for and saves his foolish friends. There is a true and better David, whose victory becomes his people's victory, though they never lifted a stone to accomplish it themselves. There is a true and better Esther, who didn't just risk losing an earthly palace, but lost the ultimate heavenly one, who didn't just risk his life, but gave his life to save his people. 
There is a true and better Jonah who was cast out into the storm so that we could be brought in. There is a true and better Passover lamb, innocent, perfect, helpless, slain so the angel of death will pass over us. He's the true temple, the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, the true sacrifice, the true lamb, the true light, and the true bread. The Bible is not a series of disconnected stories. It is a single narrative that points to one person, Jesus. have your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 20. I'll meet you there in a moment. If you forgot your Bible this morning, that's okay. The blue ones in front of you are the ones in English. John chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 18, and we'll work our way through that. But um, I'm also going to be sharing out of Matthew 27, and I'll walk you through that. There is this picture that I wanted to show you of something that really annoys me. I don't know if it annoys you, but every time that Tara and myself go to Dayland Mall for a second... That we, go to, uh, that we go to park in the baby parking, there's always that one person all the way over here, right? They're like 20 cars away. They have nothing to do with you. They have nothing. Well, you, you don't know if they, they were in a hurry. Were they hungry? Did they have to go to the bathroom? You're not sure. But what you do know is that they parked incorrectly. And so what happens is that now everyone else who parks, what happens? You step on the line, and you cross over the line, and you cross the line, and you cross the line. And then when we arrive, you know, with, 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 our, with our little creation there, the little one hasn't been out yet, um, you can't, it doesn't matter if it says baby parking because they're halfway in the middle of the sign. And even if you could stick the car in there, you can't get her out of the door anyway. So there was this one person, you know, who, who crossed the line. It just took one to just mess up the whole parking row for everybody. And that really annoys me. I don't know if it annoys you. But here's the thing. Scripture, Adam crosses the line. And the moment that Adam in the garden crosses the line, everything is off. Every person, every part of creation, every part of mankind, everything you see is off by one. And so Easter... This morning, you need to understand that the reason that, that there is a celebration today, it's not just because Jesus rose again. It's because when Jesus rises again, He sets everything back into its place and adds a layer of gloriousness where it's all going to be going into the future. So unless you have a sense, and that's why I'm kind of talking from Genesis for a moment, if you don't get this, then you don't get today. It's just another church day where we dress up a little nicer. Pastor's wearing a tie today. It must be important. He never wears one, you know. And all the old ladies grimace, oh no, in the 12 o'clock service, how can he not wear a tie and be a preacher? Paul didn't wear a tie, neither did Jesus. And they did just fine. And you have to realize that unless you capture that image in your mind, that everything is off. Once again, today makes no sense because Easter is all about the second Adam. God's Son sent to restore and sent to begin a renewal in the here and now. That is why there are churches. That is why lives are changed. That is why marriages are rescued. That is why people get out of drugs and follow Jesus. That's why all these things happen because the renewal, the new is happening in the now. And it's all building into the beautiful to come. And unless you have that in your minds and hearts, then today really makes no sense to you. It's about Easter bunnies and brunch isn't it sad that so many people are dressing up so nice today to go to lunch? They forgot that the dressing up was to go to church before lunch. But that's the only thing our society remembers. That's the echo that's left over in our society. Hey, let's dress up nice and let's go eat. Who's not different today? You're not any different either. So let's just have that in our minds before we read our text for this morning. That Easter is about Jesus Christ coming to not only 
fix, we can't use that word, but to redeem and to restore and to renew everything that we destroy. And just in case you're here and you're still clinging or trying to cling to the idea that humanity is not so bad, turn on the news for all of five minutes and take a look at what's happening around the world and you come back to me and you tell me if humanity is doing okay. And the moment that you watch the news for all of five minutes, you will realize that everything is off by one. Humans killing each other. These madmen in the Middle East crucifying children. Humanity is broken and it needs a Redeemer. And God knew that. And that's why He did not abandon us. And that is why He sent His Son to rescue us. And we're going to dig through that today. We're going to read out of John 20, verses 1 to 18, but I'm going to warn you, we're going to back up and we're going to do a mini Bible study out of Matthew 27. When uh, and During Thanksgiving time, I sat down to kind of just think through everything through the summertime. I thought John 20 would be a wonderful way to kind of cap off our sermon series through the parables. And Matthew 27, and we'll walk through it together after this passage because I want you to see Easter morning, and then we'll, 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 we'll talk about the why of Easter morning. So you understand it, so you appreciate it. So we're more grateful than ever before for it. Matthew 27 has this passage that when I read to you, you're going to be fascinated, and I hope you're going to be just blown away as I have been. And for the last however many months, five or six months since this was kind of laid out, Matthew 27 will not allow me to move forward. And it was last night at... 2.30 in the morning, when I'm laying on a couch, you know, my wife didn't kick me out. Uh, she does say I snore too much, but it's because she wakes up with baby in the middle of the night to breastfeed, and I just need to just concentrate for all of 25 minutes with you all this morning. And so she's, gr she's gracious enough to let me sleep on the couch. How about that, okay? We're turning that around. You know, and it's 2.30 in the morning, and there's something inside my head and my heart that is saying... You have to give them Matthew 27. And it's been bothering me. I said, no, 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 Matthew 27, better for next year. Better for next year. No, it's better for this year. And so the Holy Spirit wins, and we're going to talk about Matthew 27. We're going to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading this morning. And we're just going to unpack it, and we're going to go for it. So, but first, we'll, let's talk about Easter morning, John chapter 20, first 18 verses. As we always do in our church, we stand together as a show of respect to God's Word. John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. This is the word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John talking about himself, okay? Because he's writing the gospel and it's just, he's talking in the third person. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Young legs. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had, that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she, she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. 
Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. May the Lord bless his word. Thank you. Please be seated. Just a quick... uh, couple of words here and then we'll jump into Matthew chapter 27. Mary goes on Sunday morning because Jesus had died kind of towards the evening on Friday and Sabbath was about to begin and no work could be done. He was buried very quickly, kind of in a haste, okay? And then Sabbath would end the next evening and it was too late to do anything at night. And so she's coming at first thing in the morning, uh, the scripture speaks about the first kind of, there's, there were four watches in the night, and she comes in the last one, so somewhere between three and six in the morning, she's arriving. Well, there must be enough light that she can see that things have happened, how the tomb has been, the rock has been removed, uh, these big circular stones that ran kind of on a, on a closet kind of door, little rail, and uh, Matthew tells us that it had been sealed to make sure that there was no funny business about this Jesus rising from the dead. The disciples would not have that last word. And so the authorities sealed the tomb. And that was broken and there's nobody there now. Now we'll stop there for a second. And we're going to walk very briefly and very quickly through Matthew chapter 27. I'll read it for you. Uh, It'll be behind me here. and We'll just kind of walk through verse by verse so that you understand the beauty of what we just read with Mary. We're going to go back to Friday just for a moment. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Let's just stop for a second. When the scripture talks about darkness, typically God's judgment is woven in there somewhere. And when the scripture is saying it was noon, in other words, when the sun is at its highest, when it is burning brightest, when it's the middle of the day and the sun is right above you, and we should be able to see everything clearly, there is darkness, it says, in over all of the land. In other words, as far as the eye could see, there is darkness. And if there's darkness over all the land, what Scripture wants you to understand is that for here, in this moment in time, at that specific instance, God's judgment is falling. It is here. There is no postponing it. There's no wiggling out of it. You're not going to church your way out of this one. You're not going to philosophize your way out of this one. You're not going to good person your way out of this one. It's covering everything. Darkness in the middle of the day. His judgment was falling. Verse 46, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, laba sabachthami, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do not miss this. And I want you to follow me here very closely. I want you to listen very closely to what I'm about to tell you. Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 here. But what's happening with the forsaken me is this. Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God. Connected to the Father, connected to the Holy Spirit. One God of God, what substance, light of light, God of God. There has never been a moment, not one iota of a second where they have been separated. All that Jesus Christ has ever known for all of eternity, before there was time, I use the word eternity so you and me understand a very long time, but there was no eternity because there was no time, it was just God. And they always were face to face. This beautiful relationship, this beautiful glancing at the other, this beautiful embrace of the Godhead. But when Jesus Christ takes on flesh for you and for me, and he steps down to this earth, and now darkness is over all the land, God's judgment is falling on him. He has your sin and my sin, and the sin of the previous generations, and the sin of the generations that are coming, all collapsing down on him. A holy God can have nothing to do with sin. And for the smallest measurement of time, which you and I cannot calculate, and the great mathematicians of the world will never be able to articulate, it's a God thing. It's outside of us. It escapes us. God the Father has to do this to the Son. You see my hand? Everybody see it? This. That. And you say to yourself, "But, but what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Jesus Christ knows the Father 
and he knows his justice and wrath and his judgment intimately. And for that split moment, which for you and me, it says, well, that's such a short amount of time, for him is an eternity. Because all he has ever known is the face of his glorious Father. And for the tiniest fraction of a fraction, I'm just using math, mathematic words to give you a sense, because I can, we can't articulate it, but for that moment, we'll just say moment, just for that specific moment, He is alone. And there is darkness, and there is judgment, and it was done for you, and it was done for me. And in that split second, in that loneliness, and in that darkness, when all of God's wrath and judgment is being poured out on Him, what is crossing His mind is your name. Your name. Not the person sitting next to you. Not your mom or dad. Not grandma or grandpa. Your name. In that moment. For you. Because at that point, the Father's plan had now come to its first mountain peak. And in order for you and I to sing this morning, and in order for you and I to dress up and look pretty on Easter, he had to experience darkness and loneliness and judgment hanging on a cross. And all of the Father's punishment is falling on him. Why have you forsaken me? Because for the tiniest fraction, a holy, perfect God can have nothing to do with sin. And God the Father has to turn away from His own Son. He turns away from His own Son. What was most precious to Him? For you. Again, not for the person sitting next to you. Not for pastor. For you. In that moment, He said your name. Your name. Your name. That's what's happening in that one simple verse. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah, verse 37. Immediately, they ran, they got a sponge, filled it with wine, put on a staff, offered it to him to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again, two cries, Two cries. Why have you forsaken me? And now he's crying out again. He gave up his spirit. In other words, he's taken on the punishment. He's taking on the darkness. He's taking on the sin. And now he breathes his last. He has surrendered himself in his entirety. There's nothing left of him. It's all been given for you. For you. He gave up his spirit. Now watch what begins to happen. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. For those of you who are a little bit familiar with the ancient temple, kind of comes from the tabernacle in the Old Testament, there was that most holy place, kind of like the center square in the temple, and then there were like courtyards around courtyards. But in that holy place, there was a smaller room called the Holy of Holies within that, 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 that room that almost no one went in there. And in that Holy of Holies was where God's presence was set to dwell. And that's where the high priest would go in once a year to offer a sacrifice. And they had to tie a rope around his ankle, around his waist, in case he fainted in there. Nobody could go in there because it was God's presence. You had to pull the poor guy out. That's how serious it was. But there was this barrier. This curtain, just kind of in a physical sense to kind of describe it to you, was, was bigger than your hand. Imagine a curtain that thick, separating people. No one can ever look in there. To see God's presence, He was always there, and we were always here. And there was this huge chasm and gap between us, and we couldn't approach Him. And the moment that Jesus breathes His last loud voice, the curtain is torn. In other words, what Scripture wants to tell you is, there is nothing separating you from the presence of God. Nothing. There are no little steps to take. There's no table in the way. There's no pastor or priest in the way. You can come to the Father directly because of what Christ has done for you. There's nothing in the way anymore. And that's why you can raise your voice and sing. 
And that is why you can open the word. That's why we can be here because right now, in a, in a miraculous way, we are before the presence of God. We are before His throne. We are not looking at Him. He is looking at us. It's the other way around. And that's the privilege. That's the beauty of what Christ did for us that day. The curtain tore nothing in the way. No more separation. It continues, the earth shook and the rocks split. Creation is acknowledging that her architect, her great designer, if you weren't aware of it, Colossians 1 and John chapter 1 tell us that Jesus Christ shaped everything you see around you. This is his creativity. The stuff we see and the stuff we don't see. And when her designer, her creator, her Lord, He just gave her the nickname Mother Nature. When he breathes out his last, creation feels it. And she shakes. And she breaks. Because her great designer, her great architect, has breathed his last for the moment. And she felt that. The Apostle Paul tells us that creation continues to groan, waiting for him to return. You're not the only one waiting for Jesus to come back. Everything around you is. Because it's also off by one. Then, here we go. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Did you know that? When Jesus screams, dead people come to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection. In other words, today and tomorrow. And went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Restoration. You have a picture of the great resurrection to come. When Jesus screams, dead people come to life. And here's something else. For those of you who have more of a scientific mind. The Discovery Channel people and the History Channel people and the CNN special about Jesus. The one reason they never talk about this verse It's because no one at this moment in time saw what the Christians were saying, saw what was written in in the Bible and wrote, oh, by the way, that whole, you know, dead people rising and coming to the Holy City, that's not true. You know why they didn't write it? Because they saw dead people. That's why they didn't write it. They saw dead people coming out of tombs. There's nothing to write. Sorry, History Channel. Sorry, Discovery Channel. You're wrong. Not one source in the ancient world disputes this. Because people's families were put back together again. Leaders came back. Children that have been lost. Grandparents, mothers and fathers together in their homes again. After one man screams on the other side of town. That's power. That's your savior. Giving you a glimpse of what's coming. And then the impact. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Centurions were more than just generals of an army. These were hard men, hard hearts, cold-blooded killers. They kept Rome in charge at whatever cost. And here you have a man that has the the, the makeup of a stone. And he's watching what's been happening since the morning. And the only conclusion he can come to is that this is the Son of God. By what he saw, by the evidence he's seeing, that's his declaration. We'll go back to John chapter 20 now. We'll just make three brief observations on these characters. Raul, thank you. You can put the outline back up. We'll start with Peter because I included Luke chapter 24 here. Isn't it interesting that Peter had denied Jesus three times, everybody knew about it, and yet when Mary sees something and she comes running back, she reports to him. There was something about the character of Peter that in spite of his crash and burn, because the Gospels tell us that when Jesus is being tried by the high priest, Peter sneaks into the courtyard, and he's by a fire, 
before the first denial, and Jesus is just a couple of feet away. There are no windows in the ancient world, just a hole in the wall. And Jesus is being tried right there, and he's right over here. I have no idea who Jesus is. What man? What Jesus? I never spent three and a half years of my life with him, warming himself by the fire. And the scriptures tell us that at some point, Jesus looks out the window and looks this man in the eye. Can you imagine that look in the eye? Can you imagine that? Here is Peter, walked on water, saw lepers healed, saw the blind. He saw a young girl brought to life. He saw Lazarus come out of a tomb. His own mother-in-law, who was close to death, healed by He saw this, and he had the audacity with Jesus standing just feet away. I have no idea who you're talking about. And sometimes our lives do the same. He's right there. He's right there. And we're over here thinking he's not paying attention. That he's not looking at us. That he's not watching us. And in our actions and in the way that we speak and in the way that we treat one another. What Jesus? What church? What message? And Luke tells us in chapter 24 that Peter comes in. They, they kind of parallel each other. Peter comes in. John is young. And he's afraid and he knows he, he can't go in there because he'll get ceremony un, ceremonially unclean. And, but Peter doesn't care. So he just runs in and now he sees the linen. They're not folded nicely. They're not messy as if someone stole the body like you'll hear on all these specials on TV. Okay, they're in their place. The turban that wrapped the head and then the, the garment that wraps the body, the, the face and the shoulders always stuck out. They're in as if it just went. Shh. They're there. But Luke 24 tells us that Peter walks away wondering what happened. You see, he hasn't quite put it together yet. And these denials and his pushing back of Jesus has left him in a place that's kind of like confusing. And so let me just say to you this morning, if you're here this morning and you feel that way, that you have seen enough to believe, but you know, I've just done too much. I've denied him too many times by a little fire in a courtyard. There's been too many instances where I have behaved in a fashion or conducted myself in a fashion where I think he's just too far. He'll never let me come back home and I'm just kind of wondering about what I've seen. What am I going to do with what I know? I've, I've seen his power. I've seen people reconciled. I've seen homes fixed. I've seen people healed. But you know, I've just, I've done too much and I'm all the way over here and I don't think he wants me back. And John 21 tells us that when Peter went back to fishing because he was just confused and he just can't figure it out after he saw it several times, Jesus shows up in that moment at the shore and he denied him three times. And three times he asked him, do you love me? And three times Peter said, Lord, I love you. And if that's where you find yourself, you're kind of over here and you think you've done too much, you think you made too many mistakes, then Jesus is going to come to your shore. But he's going to ask you a very important question. Do you love me? Or are you going to allow your mistakes and the pride that you wrap your mistakes around to not let anybody in to help, to kind of justify and to, to make them look okay? Are you going to allow that to keep him away? Don't do that this morning. Don't do that this morning. Don't struggle to believe. Look at the evidence. Then you have John. Young man. Runs fast. Arrives first, sees but is kind of scared. Let the adult go in first. This looks a little serious. And here you have a young man. It's, it's frustrating to me. I don't know if it's frustrating to you. It's frustrating to me that the scripture always has to go mostly to young people. To believe. And to make an impact. And adults, today, I say to you, Let's do less of Peter. Well, I know all this stuff and I've seen so much and I've studied and I've read, but I'm not really sure what... And let's be more like these young folks who see it and say, yes, it makes sense. All the dots are together because John remembered the baptism. He was told about the temptation. He saw the beginning of the ministry. He saw the healings. He heard the teaching. He had his feet washed by Jesus. He saw him crucified. And now he's staring at an empty tomb. And John is saying, of course. Of course. It was very simple. 
It says here that Peter saw and was kind of wondering. John saw and believed. And I encourage you this morning. I don't know what other evidence you need, but maybe you're at a point in your life where it's time to see and believe. Because you've gone in circles long enough. It's time to step forward. And then we arrive at Mary. Here we have Mary, who scriptures tell us, and scholars argue a little bit, was she a prostitute, was she not? But what we do know that scripture is very clear about is that she had seven demons. Now one, seven within. She was a tool of darkness. She was about Satan's agenda. And Jesus set her free. And you know what? There is something to be said about the person who knows what it's like to be very far away from Jesus, to have spent time in the kingdom of darkness. You know why? Because they are the first ones that run to the tomb. The disciples, pretty nice guys, fishermen, didn't do anything wrong, good guys, good people. Where are they? Why are the women running to the tomb? Where are the men? Oh no, you know, we're having a committee meeting. We got to talk about it. Got to talk about it. We got to discuss. Did, did, did somebody bring donuts? You know? And here is Mary, the guiltiest one, who was first. And what a privilege for her that she sees two things. The first one that I want to just show you a picture of, so you get a, a picture of it. I believe we have a picture of the ark. And I want to show you this picture of the ark from the Old Testament so that you understand what she's staring at. This is the ark. I think all of us have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Okay? This was the ark of, of the covenant. And the word of God that Moses held was within. But the lid where those two cherubim are facing each other, that lid was called the mercy seat. And these two cherubim would kind of face each other, and it said that God's presence, the glory cloud and the glory fire, would come to rest like right between them. God's glory would manifest itself in the Old Testament. That, that's what Moses would see when he would come close to this thing. That's what Israel saw when this thing was carried out in front of them. And if you looked at the details, it said that she saw an angel sitting at the head of where Jesus should have, his head should have been, and at the foot. And what scripture wants you to see is this. Because when you look at an empty slab of rock, and there's no Jesus there, and there are two angels at the top and at the bottom of it, God wants you to understand, this is my glory. You are witnessing it. You are staring at it. It's no longer a cloud or a pillar of fire. It was my son. And that's what Mary is given the privilege of seeing. Thank you, Raul. The second thing that the privilege of seeing is that this woman who was a tool of darkness gets to see him first. Not Peter, not John who saw and believed, but a woman, an outsider. Again, seven demons. She had the privilege of seeing him first, which tells me again that nothing stands between you and Jesus being face to face because the separation has been torn down by Jesus Christ at the cross. No matter what's happened, no matter what you've done, you can come to Him. But here's the thing about Mary, she's facing the wrong direction. She turned to look back at the tomb, she turned to look back at the past, and He's standing right behind her, but then He says her name. Now I don't know about you, no, I think I, knew, I do know this about you. Your name is special. Special. And maybe you're a little bit upset with your parents because it doesn't match with the last name too well, but it's special. Okay? Sometimes a little rough there in some, some of the names that we, that we use today, but how beautiful will it be the day that Jesus says your name? Just think about it for a second. How beautiful will it be the day that Jesus says your name in eternity? Come here son or daughter, saying your name because of everything that happened at the cross. Love made her return. Love made her linger. It made her wait. She hurt and she wept. But once she turned and saw him, everything changed for this woman. 
And I want to close this morning, before we pray for a second, about three years ago now, we went for what seemed one of a gazillion ultrasounds when Anna was still in mommy's tummy. And we go to this place over on 87th Avenue, um, and we wait in this lobby full of people. We walk into the room. It's cold. It's dark. Machines, you know, and prop her up on the thing. And get the little, whatever that mouse thing is. I call it a mouse. I don't know what it is. You put the jelly there. And you start making noise. And there's this flat screen TV in front of us. And so she starts saying, oh, you know, here's the head and here, here's the leg and here's her spinal cord and everything looks good and, and here's the femur and you start to see this child kind of put together in front of you. And every now and then, because you, you really don't know what you're looking at sometimes, I, I would ask her, so, so what am I looking at? Well, what am I looking at? She said, oh, you're looking at this and there's a bone here and we're looking at an organ, we're looking at this. And then finally there's this one, and you can't see it too well, I just kind of brought it just to kind of show it to here because you can't scan this thing and put it up on the screen, it just won't work. She puts up this picture underneath here, and it just looks like a little bit of a blob with some dark corners. And I asked the lady, by the way, <laughs> she was so funny because she was cursing like a sailor. I don't know what happened to her that day, but boy, every other word out of her mouth was a nasty one. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, you know, we're talking about babies and cursing. I'm like, this is interesting. And so, um, we're, you know, and so, you know, she goes, what do you mean you, you know, what do you think you're, bleep looking at I'm like well I'm asking you you're the expert you know and she says you know she goes can't you see it I'm like no she goes there's a cross right in front of you so what do you mean there's a cross right in front of me she goes yeah it's right in front of you it's a cross don't you see it that's her heart the chambers and there's this cross she goes all of us have a cross at the center of our person and I thought, well, let's preach then. I'm like, well, let's, let's, let's ride this thing, okay? Because, boy, it's been dark leading up to this. I'm like, let's go. So then I thought, the cursing nurse was right. And isn't it such a God thing that the cross is not something on the wall of a church it's not something that you just wear around your neck. But my goodness, it's keeping you alive right now. When God designed you, He put a cross upon the very organ that gives you life to let you know that there would be a greater and true cross that was coming in order that you might live true lives forevermore with your Savior. There is a cross at the center of your being and God put it there to remind you that He is your God and that He is your Heavenly Father, that He is your Lord and He is your Savior and He is the lover of your soul. And that, brothers and sisters, is Easter Sunday. A cross at the center of it all. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. I just want to give you a few quiet moments to just reflect on all that we've said. And I just want to pray for us here in a few moments. Don't worry about the band. They know what they're doing. They don't need to look at anything. This is just a moment with you and God. And if you feel in this moment that you would just like to say, Lord, I'm kind of like Peter. I think I've denied you too many times, but I want to come back home, restore me. Or Lord, I'm like Mary, where I think I've just done too much, Father, but I need to be restored. If you've arrived at that place where you've seen enough and you want to believe, and you want to believe, and it's that moment, that time has come, then just in the quiet of this moment, between you and the Lord, just between you and the Lord, no one's coming to the front this morning. Pastor's praying right now. My eyes are closed just as yours, yours are. 
and I'll just open them for a split moment. If today you just want me to pray over you, pray over you that you would no longer be confused or distant, that you would no longer be far away but close to the Lord. And maybe today is just that first step, just a first step because you finally understand what's been done for you, and Easter Sunday makes sense because of the judgment and the turning away and the great radical love that's been spilled over you. The Son dying for you. And if you just need to take, turn around, kind of like Mary, turn around and face Him and begin to take those steps back home. If you find yourself there, just in this very quiet moment, private moment between you and the Lord, you can just raise your hand. You can just raise your hand. I'll pray for you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. God bless you. God bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you in the back, here on the side. God bless you here on the side. God bless you. The Lord bless you there in the back. The Lord bless you here in the front. God bless you there in the back as well. If you just want to offer a prayer, Lord, I need to come back. I'll just ask one last time before I pray. Just acknowledge it to the Lord, not to me. Between you and the, between you and God this morning. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Amen. The Lord bless you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have seen the hands that have gone up around this room. And Father, you know these individuals so much better than I ever will, even their own families ever will. And Father, you know their hearts. And Lord, they want to turn back around. And they want to come home. Because they grasp your love for them. They understand the great sacrifice, the great price that was paid to bring them home. And Father, this morning, they have acknowledged before you, I want to turn and face you, Jesus. I want to face my Savior and Lord. And I want to begin to march my way towards you. I will no longer look at an empty tomb. I will no longer look at the past. But I will move forward to the present to a glorious Easter sunrise with you. And Father, that is the prayer of their hearts. Father, please look down on them with mercy. Jesus, please let all these individuals who have raised their hand, Father, feel your embrace this morning. May your spirit work in their hearts and their lives in such a way that they know that they are not alone. That you go with them. You go before them and beside them, Lord, and behind them, Father. You are their refuge. You are the great cornerstone of their life, Lord. And this morning, Father, would you look down upon them and show them your grace and mercy. Let them know that they are greatly loved, that they are sons and daughters of the Most High. And Father, they want to get closer to you. I pray, God, that you would help them have the courage and the strength to take those steps closer to you. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we celebrate you this morning. And we thank you so much, so much for enduring that moment of separation that we might be saved. Thank you for whispering our names at the cross. And I pray that we will not take that lightly. Change us, Lord. Change us, Lord. Make us more like yourself. Father, we love you. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Amen. If you're visiting with us today, we are so glad that you're here. We hope that you feel feel and have felt comfortable here in our family of faith. Uh, this is the moment in our service where we collect our tithes and our offerings. Uh, while the offering is being collected, please, if you could take a moment to fill out the communication card in front of you. Uh, we like to stay in touch with you. We send out a weekly newsletter with church info. You can take one of those, fill it out. If the plate comes by a little too quickly... You can leave it on the table or just hand it to me in the lobby after the service. Having said that, Danny and Kathina will collect the morning offering.
as they went. The morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was falling. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon him. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broke. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you to be.
into the church and this year our Christian Explorer course had four folks and we have two young ones that might get baptized later on but nonetheless I just want to ask them to come forward and we're going to pray over them just for a moment. Uh, Gigi and Nikki, brother and sister, we'll ask you guys to come forward. And Nikki and then Jesus David and Rosie which they're new to our church. Yeah, give them a round of applause. But, and I'm going to sound a little older now, I've known them since they were children, like children, you know, and so when, when some of the children start to kind of come through the halls, you know that you're starting to get a little bit old, and thank God for hair gel because it hides the white hair very good, so I'm very happy about that. Oh, uh, can I ask Danny and Kathina to come forward? I think, I, did I see Sandy out there? Is Sandy out there somewhere? Sandy, come forward for a second, and Ricky who's our youth pastor for Nikki? just come forward and just put your hands on their shoulder. We just want to lay hands on them for a second. These are some of the leaders of our church. And you all can hold hands together. We'll kind of make a little circle here for a second. I just want to, as they come forward, um, a quick question for the four of you. Um, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If so, please say yes. 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 And uh, do you desire to grow spiritually here at this church? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your children. For these young individuals uh, who you have called to yourself. And Father, they have taken that step forward and said, we want to be a part of this church uh, in a more formal way. And serve it in a deeper capacity. And Father, we just thank you for their lives. We ask you a blessing over their families. Father, we ask you to continue to, Lord, pull them towards you. May they continue a glorious walk towards their Savior. Thank you for their lives. Bless them, Lord, and thank you for bringing them here to our family of faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome. Vacation Bible School that's coming up this summer. So uh, that Vacation Bible School is always a favorite part of my summer growing up as a kid, and it still is now getting to help out with it. So June 15th through the 19th, put it on your calendar. If you have a young one, uh, put that on your calendar and to sign them up. If you have want more information on that, you can see JB. She will be out in the lobby. You can begin signing up your children already uh, for $45. If you have a family member that has a young one, uh, invite them to that as well. And then for the adults and teenagers, if you are available that week to help out in any way, uh, please see JB as well, because we'll definitely need the support of our entire church. And you'll hear more about that coming up. Um, the next announcement uh, is, is going to be... We'll, we'll talk about this one at the very end. The next announcement is going to be Miami Rescue Mission. Um, so April 26th, well, we're going to head out to the Miami Rescue Mission in downtown Miami. We have a partnership with them where we help them 
um, help others. And so we go there and we prep food with them and we serve the homeless there. It's always a really powerful experience for us as we get to serve and for the people that we serve. Just by extending that, that hand of love and, and that smile really makes a huge impact. So we invite you to that April 26th. Uh, we'll meet here in the church parking lot and then we'll head over together. And then we just want to let you guys know to kind of put in your calendar Sunday, May 24th. We're having a big Memorial Day barbecue, so we'll have a free barbecue and bounce houses for the kids outside. So put that on your calendars. You want to be here and you want to invite someone to that. Uh, we always have a great time with that. And then, uh, and then just remember that today after the service next door, we're going to have a free brunch for you all. We're catering a free brunch. So we ask you all to stay and then we'll have an Easter egg hunt for the, for the younger ones. Uh, so that's always a great time. So be sure to stick around after the service. Happy Easter, and I'll pass it over to Edwin. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, um, we, we gave our volunteers a break this Easter, and we catered in a wonderful breakfast for you. So go next door and enjoy that. Um, as I said at the top of the service, we'll repeat it again. Next Sunday, uh, you, we will have a guest speaker, Katarina Rosenblatt. I'll be here kind of uh, guiding the service, but she's going to be sharing her testimony. We made a commitment to bring her every Sunday after Easter. She runs an organization which frees young ladies from human trafficking here in the South Florida area. She was trafficked herself when she was younger. She's going to share her testimony on that. Some of you who were here last year heard part of her testimony. She's going to share a little bit more. She also wrote a book that she announced last year. It's finally finished. She's going to bring it with her if you want to kind of read about her life. And she's going to bring a young lady who was being trafficked at FAU uh, on campus. They rescued her out of that lifestyle and out of that situation. And uh, her name is Joy, and she's going to be sharing her testimony as well. So it'll be a very powerful Sunday, so we invite you to come on back and, and, and be a part. You can actually contribute to the organization and be a part of setting young women and children free from human trafficking. Having said that, no more announcements. Let's stand together. Would you uh, hold each other's hands across the way as a family of faith? We'll dismiss in prayer and with worship, and then run next door and get yourself a good breakfast. Right? Leave pastor just one little plate. You know, and enjoy the Easter egg hunt with your children. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great sacrifice of your son. And we thank you that in eternity past, Jesus said, yes, I will go and I will save them and I will set them free. And I will prepare a wonderful new creation for them to walk side by side with me. Father, we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit who resides within us and who brings us ever closer to you by impressing upon us the presence of Jesus Christ, by opening our eyes to your word, uh, to the worship, Father, in prayer. May our glory and honor and blessing always be to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
Christmas.